Welcome, Mike, to Big Content. Right off the rip, we're doing a draft. No, you have to introduce yourself. Go. Go. I like how yourself. you felt compromised there. <laughs> <coughs> no, no, no. I wanted it to just be in the intro. Should I do the welcome bike again? No, I, I think we're in it now. People love us. They love our vibe. Facts, okay. But um, but give them context. Sure. Uh, I'm Nick Ercolano. I started BDGE, Big Dogs Gotta Eat. We're a sports media brand that focuses on NBA. <laughs> I'm Jack Settleman, founder of Snapback Sports, a sports media brand that loves sports. And this podcast is called Big Content, and we talk about the creator economy. Okay. That was, like, well done. That, that was, like, maybe... I should just hit the welcome back, and then you should just do like I take the, over like the, the corporate intros. cuck intro. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I got you, should, you. you should cuck the audience, and then we'll get into the content. Uh, we're starting off this episode right off the bat with a draft of our favorite social platform updates. So features, yeah, features, whatever they've become. Essentially, any update is technically also a feature, but it's like what you didn't have to what you do have from a creator standpoint yeah of course of course okay not like uh social tagging for brand partnerships well one of my first one of my first ones was like uh do you remember this is not one of my picks but on instagram you were they didn't have the ability to like share you saw a post that you're like this is funny to share to your homies in dms like you had to tag them remember you you tag like six people and then they did that update and then like half of your comments evaporated because people are now just sharing it <laughs> yeah. to their homies instead no, of that's actually a good point like if if anyone who uses instagram I, I actually think you should think about your social strategy a lot more about getting shares because if you click insights you can see comments likes etc but they show you how many times it's been shared and the highest performing content is actually highly correlated with the amount of shares that it that it has i think instagram reads that so without further ado i'll give you the first pick we'll snake it and then the the comments will vote on the victorious. Okay. I think um the best feature or update or maybe something that was there from the start, I'm not actually sure, but on TikTok and you could do it on YouTube actually too, and probably on Instagram Reels at this point, but the being able to reply to comments to mm. make a video. Like when it's like plastered on there and it's for a few reasons. One, it's content that you didn't have to think of. Like you didn't have to go out of your way to ID on the content. You could take the most popular comments. So you already know it's the most engaging part of the video from the previous video. So if everyone's liking it or everyone's commenting on that one top comment or thread, you know everyone's like thinking about it. Everyone wants to be part of that conversation. So now you're just making a video about the most popular topic from your previous video. So it's almost like this natural cadence of highest engaging to a new higher engaging type thing. Yeah, love that. My number one pick is AI captions, automated captions. Mm. So I think they really, really help new creators add context to their video, like captions in general. And the fact that you can do it so seamlessly, you don't have to go into Premiere, you don't have to download the audio track, edit the captions, you can just plop it right in there. And they have that feature on TikTok. They even have it on Snap, but they definitely have it on Instagram Reels as well. Uh, super underrated because the Instagram and TikTok captions are actually fairly accurate. I would say like way more accurate than I see on like even Premiere or some of the professional They're getting tools. good. They're really, really strong. And I'll throw a little bonus nugget in that the AI caption mess ups, especially on TikTok, have actually created some pretty viral videos. So if you mess up a word, it'll create a lot of engagement and it could be funny. It could be not so funny, but just super <laughs> engaging. So uh, that's my number one. My number two is AB testing for thumbnails. So we first use this on Snapchat on our Snapchat shows. You got four options and we create four thumbnails that were slightly different with not only different thumbs, but also different titles as well. YouTube has been doing it with Mr. Beast. I think they released it to a subset of creators, but I'm excited for it to come to uh, essentially like all of us who are who are creating content. The thumbnail and title, the packaging of a video or a piece of content is so important. And sometimes we spend all this time, literally all this time, creating a piece of content. You want to get the caption right. You want to get the thumbnail and title right. But there's always two angles to it, and you never really know. And the fact that some platforms have updated this is is very important. Yeah, you don't have access, you said, to the YouTube one? I don't. Do you? I don't either. No, I yeah. use I use TubeBuddy, which is like an outside source that's right. partnered with YouTube. But again, I have problems with their A-B testing. I don't think it's 
refined, and I don't think it I really. I don't think like, it's good. I don't yeah. think it does the job that the new YouTube one yeah. will. So that's that's a really really good one. And I and I saw that. it recently. I was on like our Snapback Sports YouTube account scrolling. I saw Mr. Beast one hundred thousand dollar job versus ten million or whatever it was, and it was like him in a suit, and then. On a different account, after a couple of days, it it was one him at the Buccaneers game in a jersey versus something else, and it looks like that one ended up winning out. So mm-hmm. it was very interesting to see it actually in effect. Yeah, that that's um, the A B testing. I'm I'm shocked that's not more of like a a, f- a feature on almost every platform yeah. right now, right? Because like, there's so many intricacies to it, and we spent all of last episode literally just talking about packaging, like how important just like yeah. a thumbnail and a title is yeah. for those things. Um, so moving on. Now, this is one that I don't look at it the same way anymore, and I've never actually wanted this before, but I do think it was one of the key features that's ever been established in social media in general is the blue check mark. Mm. It, it is just iconic. Mm. You know, like the blue check mark, it used to mean something. It used to mean no, something. No, it still does. It still does. Mm, I would say on Twitter, obviously not anymore because you just get a check mark because you pay to be part of Twitter blue. But I also think it, it sets the fact that They've embraced the creator economy and said, you know, to to put ourselves into that conversation, I need to pay the eight bucks a month. Like I, I think I'm I'm talking about it talking from about like a verification. verified, right? Yeah. You're I'm talking, talking about, about like yeah. Instagram, hundred fifty k. Like yeah. I got a blue check mark type thing. Yeah, that was something I think a lot of people like strive for, and it it was it had its own personal brand within social media accounts. Yeah, I I've never had one to this day. I have it on Twitter now because I pay for Twitter Blue, mm-hmm. and I've never like tried to get one, but I understood what it meant. From a creator perspective, like yeah. if you had one, you typically were, you know, slid up in comments. You typically were able to be noticed. And it just put like this level of uh, credibility or verification well, there behind were, you. There were two sides. There was the person who was just trying to brag that they were verified. Mm-hmm. And then there's the people and why I pay for Twitter blue, because you actually benefit from the features. When someone sure. lands on your page on Instagram, they see a blue check, instant credibility. When, when you comment, you're more likely to get likes, which right. pushes you up to the top, gets more views on your page. So, uh, it's yeah. like, and, and being in people's DMS, like for whatever purpose, if mm-hmm. you're a blue check mark, they're going to notice that right away. You stick out with yeah, a million you, other yeah. people. And, and I think that's actually one of the things that YouTube, you can get verified, but it actually means pretty much nothing. I don't even know if there's features that you benefit from. I don't either. From. Isn't it, it's like a little gray. It's gray, right. Too. It's not yeah. blue. Yeah. 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 Okay. I like that. That's a good one. I guess the next one I would use would be just the swipe up feature on stories, I guess, or like Snapchat, Instagram, okay. whatever. And you could probably speak to this more than I can because I feel like you've probably utilized it mm-hmm. way more. But this was a feature that kind of came out and like links were always tough to um, tough to utilize on Instagram because they don't natively form URLs within the captions or whatever. Yeah. So you had to find different ways to not force people to go to like, oh, link in bio or whatever. This was kind of like a shortcut where it's like stories are very personal. You know, you're talking about something. You're like, you want to go straight to the thing that I'm talking about right now. Just swipe up. Got it. Quick. So you're saying because yeah. on Instagram stories right now, it's less of a swipe up. It's a click a link. Sure. How they've altered it, it was a swipe it up. Used but like to be a, same concept. Yes, yeah. it used to be a swipe up, and used to need like ten thousand Instagram followers to actually even post a link yeah. to your story on Snapchat. It is still a swipe up. You can click the link, but you can swipe up as well. It's been, I mean, vital for our business. So and, and also like you, you were saying how creators should emphasize posting content that's like shareable Mm -hmm. stories are like their own. A lot of people think of stories as like, I'm just sharing my like day to day, whatever stories is like a, a a piece of content that you can actually like ideate around and and focus on and make a part of your like content creation plan. And if you're making something that's super shareable, putting a link or whatever in can exponentiate the effect there. Yeah. Hallie DMS me Instagram stories all the time time. of of stuff that she wants me to buy for her. (laughs) And and those stories have links. And (laughs) then you probably got to buy some of them. My number three is, is very similar to your number one, actually. So I think I'm getting a little value here, which is I'll give credit to Snapchat and say Snapchat filters or lenses. But the general theme being platforms, creating automatic content creation tools. So, Green screen on TikTok, obviously Stitch on TikTok as well, but any of those filters that we've seen go viral. And now with CapCut, CapCut, which isn't a social platform, or maybe it technically is, I view it more as a video editing platform, but just the fact that 
you used to just have to find a good set or find good lighting to now I could literally be walking on the street, throwing a green screen. You'd have no clue besides might be a little loud out there. So that super, anything that makes it super easy for a young content creator to create content, I think is a great update. And then my last one is what we teased last episode and that's collaboration on Instagram. The first super meaningful talk about what exactly collaboration is first. Yeah. So collaboration on Instagram is if I have my account, which has a hundred thousand followers and I post a piece of content that Nick is also in, I can collaborate with him and it will show this content to both of our audiences. So it's not like you just like tagging me in the, in the caption or the comments or whatever. It's literally like it goes up on both your profiles. Exactly. And it's exposure to both audiences, most importantly. And so it's, I'd say the closest thing to like a retweet to a degree, but it's kind of sharing in that audience and then the content's going to perform better. And so, you know, in the past you would get tagged. People would have to find intrigue in the content, go see that. And they still have to do that, but this is just a much more seamless way to interact with an audience. I think like the whole tag feature is actually kind of cool too. If like we had never seen it before and like you just posted a picture and then the tagging feature came out like a week later, I think that's an underrated. You think? Yeah. I feel like tag is in every business ever. Mm, I, I think in like, like you could have been tagged in like, like Shutterfly back in the day. But not like on the pictures, tapping on the pictures. I think like there was. You're t- saying like being able to click the. <laughs> I think that's a really underrated, like, smooth, seamless... Well, on Instagram. Yes, on Instagram. Because think, okay, like, Facebook TikTok, Facebook had it back in the day, but I, you couldn't... I don't think you could pinpoint where the people were. I no, think you could, you could. It, you you could. sure? Yeah, because I thought it was just in the caption where it was, like, the friends, 13 like, people. You would tag them, like, you True know, that. Yeah. Tag low is a fire I, feature. Tag is solid. And because it feels, like, super clunky on uh, TikTok. Yes. That, like, for whatever reason, that when you click on someone on uh, Instagram, it feels like... Like seamless. Yeah. Same I will thing say on Twitter. The stories TikTok? sometimes though. Like if people who are tagged in stories and you yeah. like tag someone, yeah. sometimes it can be fucking hard yes. to click on them. But on on TikTok, it's like, ah, like yeah. I don't know. It, it maybe we're too online to yeah. to fully explain that. But yeah, that's how I feel when I'm. Like, For my last one, I don't know if I have a good one. I'm a big fan. I've already spoken about this of the TikTok creativity program. I think it's like the purest yeah. form of actually paying a creator for doing the work. Yeah. Um, I think it's good money. I think it incentivizes the right type of content being made. Yep. Uh, you, you do have to have a decent following and you have to put a lot of uh, volume out and it is not easy to qualify for it. But I do think like if you're putting out a lot of volume over the course of a month, you could start to project like how many views you're going to get in total and start to like put that into a little bit of a business plan for yourself. So the idea of like paying creators, whether it's AdSense yep. and AdSense doesn't pay great. Like you have to do crazy views, but I do think the fact that these Snapchat, platform- Snapchat's program. Yeah. hundred percent. Like, like if- I'm now making about a hundred bucks a day on Snapchat. Really? Um, okay. Maybe, maybe even a little more. I've been more active. So let's say 150 bucks. So like 50 K uh, a yeah. year. That's you, all going to just go be back a full time Snapchatter <laughs> and live on the streets. And but seriously, just like yeah. these paid the um, the the platforms is cool because it's almost like the creators are building up leverage to the point where it's like we have enough power that if you're not paying us, we're just going to move to another yes. platform. So it's cool that whether it's AdSense, whether it's the creativity program, whether it's whatever. No, it, it begs is. the question right now because our YouTube for Punchline. Uh, shorts are really flying. We're, t- we're doing great on long form, but shorts are, are like flying. And I'm wondering why YouTube, if our video is a minute plus, even though it's vertical, why can't they reward the same as, as them? Like we, we got 250,000 mm. views on a video and, and I just saw the revenue. It's like 30 bucks on TikTok. That would be what? Like a hundred something bucks yeah. or 200 bucks. Yeah. Right. Um, my, instinct would be like this is one of the reasons that i'm like tiktok's creativity program is something i'm like nervous about long term yeah it feels less sustainable and more an investment from their side like like the money the math doesn't make sense for tiktok over five to ten years but it's a bet that they're putting on creators over the next two years we're like we're going to give away millions of dollars and hopefully that means that you're going to create a brand on TikTok and stay for the yes. year and, three to 10. And I read the information. That's why YouTube wouldn't do it probably. Yeah, I read the mm-hmm. information's uh, newsletter yesterday. And they said, if TikTok's starting to feel more like YouTube, like. You read that? Yeah. That, Am I in it? Uh, no, they didn't quote you on that. 
Uh, I was actually in it. Oh, really? The, yeah. Wait, really? That, that girl that Kyle? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was in her, like, uh, she dropped an article a couple days ago. Yeah. I thought you were, like, actually going to reference it. No, no, that is what, I, uh, why your TikTok feed is looking more like YouTube. You're, you're quoted in here? Maybe not that one. She did a, uh, she dropped an article. I think it was behind a paywall. I don't know if it went to the newsletter. I, ha- I, ha- I have the paywall. She, she did an article about the TikTok creativity program. Huh. Yeah. She interviewed, I guess, me and, like, two other creators, I think. All right, here we go. Similarly, Nick Urcolano <laughs> makes sports videos and started online fantasy football brand BDG is also making TikTok videos, some exceeding seven minutes. Urcolano is already comfortable with the longer format. After years of creating videos on YouTube, some of which run as long as an hour, he didn't bother signing up for TikTok's creator fund after others compl- complained of lackluster earnings, which was, so for those who don't know, there was a creator fund, which was the typical social platform. We're giving away a billion dollars over the next two years. Charlie D'Amelio cashed in like half a billion dollars, and the rest of us got like 10 cents <laughs> each. Um, then there was a creativity program, which Nick is saying is actually sustainable for young creators. You said it's a little tough to get into. I don't think the parameters are too crazy. I think it's, nah, it's 10,000 like, followers. If you, yeah, if you're just starting out, like 10,000 seems like a very, very large hill to climb at the beginning. But it's also like if you don't plan on getting a 10,000 on a platform – you're probably not going to be a full-time creator sure. unless it's a newsletter, whatever. Uh, but I'm this, just saying, like, whereas a like Google AdSense, the the bar I don't think is that high, is it? No, it's a thousand. But you it's saw four, it have a thousand subs. Yeah, okay. thousand subs, but four thousand hours in watch time. That's actually the trickiest part. I don't know. That's, that, a, that's that, a lot. That's a volume play rather than right. like getting subscribers or whatever is. Like you actually have. I to think getting a thousand subs on YouTube is as hard as getting ten thousand on fo- on TikTok. If yeah, it came maybe. in long form, yeah. YouTube. I'm just saying, not everybody can get into it. Yeah, go. But this program, you joined TikToks. You just want to hear me read read about. I just you. want you to be done yapping. <laughs> but this summer, you joined TikTok's creativity program, which re- which rewards longer videos. Six hundred twenty seven thousand followers said he's made about nineteen thousand from the program. Uh, how many months was that kind of based off of? July. Okay, I so six, we'll call it six months. November, so three yeah. k uh, a month, but you you guys are doing serious views, serious volume. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm excited. We're getting paid strictly to make content. He said, but in no way am I starting to rely on it. I don't know how long this is going to last for. Yeah, so yeah. it's basically exactly what I yeah. just said. And it's a sa- <laughs> it's funny because like our phone conversation was like over an hour long. And yeah, it's just like two sentences. No, that's more. I I've talked to her before. Same thing. It's mm-hmm. like three lines and they really put in a lot of hard work. I yeah. give, I give them credit for it. Yeah. All right, let's recap this draft and then vote in the comment section who won my picks. Number one, AI captions. Number two, AB testing for thumbnails. Number three filters or content creation tools. Number four, collaboration on Instagram. My picks were, I I'm an idiot. I have my list and I would delete them as I took them. <laughs> so I don't have them anymore. <laughs> Number one was the ability to make a video replying to a comment. Number two was the blue check mark. Number three was the swipe up feature. Number four was just the, I specified TikTok creativity program, but I think AdSense or Snapchat's paid programs all work. I want to talk about two other ones that were taken away. Mm. And I want to get your opinion on maybe why. Okay. And just vent a little bit about them. <laughs> One, TikTok taking away the ability to pin a comment. Yeah, Why? Thanks. That's what I'm saying. That was bizarre. Ridiculous. I don't know. Did that incentivize like bad behavior within the community? Like, I don't, I don't know no, either, I, but that was like one no, of the I, best. I would features. actually argue that nowadays the, some of the worst comments get pushed to the top and I can't pin the, the actual comments that I like. Do you think it had more to do with, uh, creators like promoting things like being like, buy my shit or like, Maybe, bio, but, like that kind but of thing. That's what it should be for. Like these platforms, have to understand that we're here on borrowed time. So we also need to make money in other places unless you're going to fully fund our operation, which the I'm just, I'm just asking, like, I'm not arguing with TikTok. I'm asking you. (laughs) No, I am. That feels like maybe the main reason why. Yeah. I don't, I don't know, but good call. Uh, two, YouTube took away the dislike button on videos. Uh, 2023. Wait, that's not true. That's been gone for like a little over a year now. No, this was a big thing. Yeah. What do you, so, so brother, I'm a YouTube guy. You're not. No, no, no. Whoa. Yeah, yeah. I'm a YouTube It didn't happen while you became a YouTube guy. Wait, so. There's if, no dislike button. So then why is my video 98.9% likes? Liked. Did they bring it back? They've, bro. No, no, no. I'm telling you, this got, this got taken no, no. away. Yeah, for, yeah, but it's been back. Really? Yeah. What? You're telling me you have 100% like rate on your videos? You haven't yeah. even noticed? Yeah. <laughs> I always have 100% <laughs> like 
Oh, uh, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. You got me. You're a fraud. Oh, but it doesn't show the counter, though. Oh, that, that's what okay, I'm saying. Okay, okay. It doesn't say, it doesn't show. That, that's what I'm talking about. Oh, you're just a hater. Why would you want that? I, I Because as a consumer or a creator, it... Yeah. it no, I think it, I, le- I think it leads to groupthink and, and it can be negative. I think if, if you dislike the video, go dislike it, but don't come to a video and... From a consumer standpoint, though, like if I click on a video... I think that's what the view count does. <sighs> I Maybe. think the view count gives you a very good idea of if it's good content or not after a certain period of time. And if it's like clickbait, you'll go into the comment section. Like I'll give you an example. Casey, Casey messed up for the first time and he posted a punchline clip and it was the wrong title and thumbnail. Like he, he got sent a title and thumbnail. Like it was a mistake or it was bad? It was a mistake. Okay. But because of the mistake, it turned out to be clickbait. Like, the video was essentially, which player on the Ravens is most like Draymond Green? And it was Roquan Smith. Okay. But then the caption, and then we had a separate video, which was like, who's the dirtiest player in the NFL? And it was a picture of Draymond Green. Or it was a picture of something else. Miles Garrett. So it was just like, the videos were actually close, and the thumbnails were close. But it mm. came out looking like clickbait. And the comments were like, I'm going to unsubscribe because this is clickbait. Mm. And, like, this doesn't make any sense. Whatever. Um, comments, yes, but that the dislike button does that also without people leaving comments. It's also now you could just go to the comments, I feel like, and those... Is there a dislike on the comments? Or the numbers? No, there's are, likes. Okay. You would just be liking comments that are negative. I don't know. I, I feel I, like that I, was another I, indicator. No, I, I hate... Think about if they did that on all content. Yeah. Dislike. No, like, you're right. That's there there I, is a level of group thing to it, yeah. of course, I would like make it way worse. It becomes even more toxic. We don't need more toxicity. That's fair. <laughs> In social Bring media. back bullying. <laughs> uh, all right. So this next topic is... All right. So let's jump right into the episode. <laughs> <laughs> this next topic is how do you turn one viral piece of content into a more consistent following. We've talked about virality in uh, in the show in the past, but I think this is obviously hits close to home. Will, who uh, produces, edits, runs social, pretty much makes this show go, um, had a TikTok recently. So he covers academy for Arsenal. So like minor leagues of soccer or youth of soccer, uh, English soccer, and had a TikTok account with What'd you say? 29 followers? Yeah, yeah 29 followers. Post a video, and it is at 174,000 uh, after checking, and now gained 1,000 followers from that. So you're probably sitting there wondering, how do I take that and you know continue to grow off of it? Before we get into that, I want to actually break down that piece of content, why I think it went viral, because Will said this content, you know, there's no video. It's just can a bunch we, of highlights. Can we watch it with the audience in real time? Yeah. As, send it yeah, to I me too sh- so I can, I can watch show it. it to you. Cheeto Obi is our very own OC man waiting at home. And I just can't wait to see what the future holds for this immense talent. What makes Cheeto tick? What makes Cheeto different than the rest? What makes Cheeto destined for greatness? So, I mean, I can play the rest, but that's pretty much... All it is, as Will said, like, it was just a recording for the podcast. Can you show me, show me the opening again? Cheeto Obi is our very own OC man waiting at home. And I just can't wait to see what the future holds. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to give you the context about all the soccer okay. pieces in here. Because there, there was like three words in the beginning yeah. that I wasn't sure. All right, so <laughs> Cheeto Obi is this player in Arsenal's Youth Academy. So he's a, he's a superstar to be, theoretically. OC man is one of the best players in Italy. Okay. Uh, so he's tying those together. So for an NFL comparison, it could be like Quinn Ewers is the next Peyton Manning, right? Mm-hmm. So an obvious, like you're using a, a well-known player to kind of tie this sure. together. Thumbnail is strong. That I think that was great. Um, the real kicker here is that he pulled this content right after Cheeto Obi, is that how you pronounce his name? Had 10 goals in a game. So he's in the news. People are probably going on TikTok. Mm. They're searching his name. And boom, that's where uh, they find this piece of content. It's also very controversial because there's other younger Arsenal players who are projected to be superstars. So that's the top comments. Oh, it was supposed to be this guy and this guy. Now you're saying it's this guy. So that's why I think the piece went viral. Hyper specific to search engine optimization platforms like YouTube or TikTok, where people are constantly searching. So we see this on Punchline all the time. 
I'm now including instead of like a caption being, you know, uh, who do you think is the best wide receiver in the NFL? And Marlon's talking about that. It'll be like Marlon Humphrey says Tyree kill Justin Jefferson and Devonte Adams are the best receivers in the NFL. You're just optimizing for SEO on those platforms. And it, and it really, really helps as opposed to, a platform like maybe Instagram where historically you were optimizing for as many comments as possible. So it'd be like, who do you think's the best mm. wide receiver in the NFL? Um, so that's why I think that went viral without knowing the context of soccer. I think mm. the formula that you laid out, like being able to tie something really well known to something unknown mm -hmm. because everybody wants to be the first to understand something that's kind of unknown. So I almost think that formula in itself could work for football or soccer or sports but it could also work for like if Joe Pomp put out a podcast or an article tomorrow that was like Snapback Sports is the next bar stool. Yeah. Here's why that would be super clickable because everyone's like, "What's the next bar stool? Who's the next like innovative company or whatever?" Haven't heard as much about like Snapback. So a lot yeah. of people will be unfamiliar that no bar stool done on Snapback. I think that formula in itself was kind of like a gold mine. Maybe you jumped on it. This like, artist is the next Drake. Like it, it literally applies. People to love anyway. comps. Yeah, yeah, we do that during football all the time. Yeah. Like with the rookie class coming in, we're always like. This guy is this guy, stylistically, yeah. athletically, whatever, because they want to, people want to understand things, I think. They quickly. Want, yeah. And it, and it does it quickly. Yeah. So I think just that piece of content, that's why it probably works so well, along with obviously it being like a trending topic. Yes. Trending, especially on TikTok. TikTok's become kind of a newsy platform to yeah. a degree where people go and search on there. And it's major credit to them, but you also should definitely be taking advantage of that. I see Instagram trying to get into that, not actually with threads, but if you search now, you can search like, you could search his name on Instagram and it'll give you pieces of content that are related to him, but it's not going to work as well because they've also tied in that feature where it's like, you might also search this yeah. right which has been huge for it's actually back, a so. cool feature yeah. it's a great that probably feature. should have been yeah that could have been honorable yeah. mention in the draft <laughs> in the, for sure the draft. Um, all right so the the original yeah. question now is how do you turn one viral tiktok into a more consistent following with a viral piece of content there's obviously something within it that went right and you want to try to figure out what that is i would say make sure first of all if you're going to go after something like that that's going to be replicated that's going to be the same right you see the piece of content you say mm, can i do this again how many times can i do this again make sure one that it's something that you enjoy doing two it's something that you could see yourself doing long term and it could be very specific but it could be more longer term as well because we've now internally had I, I would say multiple pieces of content that have been at least like semi-viral for a long period of time mm -hmm. And the first thing that you'll realize is like, you can get boxed in very quickly if you become known, right? Because you could put out a thousand videos to 20 people mm -hmm. for five years and they'll know you for that. You put out yeah. one video that gets you from 20 people to 20,000 people and 99.99999% of your audience that. now only knows you for one thing. Yeah. So if you're going to attack the angle of virality, understand that all those new people coming in will only know you for this thing. And you can't get mad at them for that. And you, it's not their fault that they just found you through this thing. That being said, assuming that what you're making that went viral is something that you're passionate about and that you like doing, I would try to replicate that formula. Like, I think your brother, Casey, mm -hmm. did this really well. Yeah. Where he was like rebuilding a soccer team. He's like, this worked. Let me now transfer this to the next team, mm -hmm. the next team, the next team. Because there's something within that video that people inherently just like. They like whether it was the format, they like this or that or the other thing, I would try to replicate it as much as you possibly can in the next video. It might not do as well. It might do two times better because maybe there's a more trendy topic available to you. Yeah. But if not, I would try to break down like the key principles of that video, what you think it was, whether it was the attachment of like the unknown to the known, yeah. I would go to the next team. Maybe it's, maybe it's another team that you find a really good comp for and try that again and see if that works. I would maybe keep the same editing style. I would try not to change as many variables as possible so that you know like what the thing is that works or doesn't work. Because once I, you change it, I would say things, I think the format definitely worked. <laughs> the The format of com the comp and then the trending really worked for, for this video. 
uh, he's team specific, so I wouldn't say mm, go and okay. outside the team. I That's would just info. pick a new player. That's how I would test that. Or yeah, that pick that a new player thing. and then maybe comp him to a different type of player. Yeah. Be like, this is the new. Here's a defensive player that yeah, we yeah. can comp from this, and it also will start to um, link your con- the the audience's mind to the fact that you are a, a, an expert in the field of younger players. Like they'll start to think of you as a guy who understands like the club team and the under 18 team or whatever. If these popular pieces of video are centered around those. So I like that. Like take the same formula that you just did and continue to try to hit it home over and over and over and over again. And a lot of newer consumers, I think too, and and we get this same thought process in our head where it's like, I don't want to oversaturate. I don't want to like keep doing the same thing, become like a one trick pony. You got to understand that like of your audience, like 10% of them see everything that you're yeah, posting. If that. Like, yeah, like you could post the same thing 50 times and still 20% of your audience is probably going to see it. Yeah. So there might be like one or two comments like, oh, you just do the same thing over and over again. doesn't matter. Like they're just, they're just one of one or two people that will continually say that kind of shit over and over mm-hmm. again. But if it's working, continue to do it as long as you like it. Because again, you might get boxed in if you only try to go down one path. But as long as it's something that you're comfortable with and you like doing, then it's not a bad thing to be boxing yeah. for that. No, I, I don't think that that <laughs> format is is bad at all. It's great. Um, I did, like, the top 15 places, top 15 stadium foods on my TikTok. And for a period of time, I mean, it did, like, 10 million views. The second video did 5 that. million. That was, like, when right? we kind of first started this. Yeah. So we talked about that a yeah. lot. And yeah. so now I grew to 110,000 followers which is great on paper, but then when I put out a content that's not food related, like it still had that mix between sports and food, but still a quarter of the audience is like, oh, I'm here for the food, right? Not the stadium stuff. Yeah. And so it it limits your views for a little, but you can gradually like create content and and mesh that audience like you've done with your TikTok account, right? You started Ike's Lunch, that's what blew up. And then you had format that look very similar but is more in what you want to hit right um so you're, you're breaking it down you're taking different yeah. pieces of things that work and it's not always like the niche or the industry or even the topic that you're discussing it's how you're discussing it i think um and, and it's all these different things that are obviously factored in at once but it kind of goes back to the conversation we had last week too where it's i think breaking apart as much as you can like the niches that you're going down or the topics that you're going down being able to separate them is good because you will build up the goodwill with your audience yes. and they know what to expect when pulling up. And the less you do that, the harder it will be to engage with all of your audience. But I think it's worthwhile when thinking about a little bit longer term, like what you want to be known for and how do you connect that viral piece of content with like making the subject of what you want to be known for part of that piece of content. In yeah. a sense. Don't cheat it. My last piece <laughs> of advice that I actually always give when it comes to virality is uh like ride the wave and like almost like double triple down in the moment and it could be for two days it could be for a week but like when you're hot and have that momentum on social you have to think about that 174k video people are coming to your page so you're never getting more hits on your page which means if you have two more pieces of content the floor for that is higher which means that's going to thrust it into a chance to to the next video going viral next video i actually have another good like real life example happening right now about this uh, Alex Caruso, who mm-hmm. is in the fantasy football industry for the most part, um, he has been fully submerged into like the gambling world yeah. right now. And all he does is really tweet about picks. During the summer, he would make these fantasy football threads, being like, these are the 10 players you need to draft, whatever. Yep. It was a format that he found a formula for that worked really, really well, that helped him grow up to like 80,000 mm-hmm. Twitter followers or whatever. And since then, as soon as the season hit, he, he went into full like gambling mode. He yep. went into full prize picks, underdog, Mm -hmm. sleeper mode. And he has since grown up to over 200,000 followers. And I was talking to him yesterday because we text like kind of frequently. He's been at the office multiple times. And like we talked about how if you find, once you find that leverage point, dig in as much as you can because you're going to look back in two months and be like, damn, I I regret not going as hard as I could for that because the ROI on hitting a leverage point and squeezing out as much as you can is like five years of work collapse into a month or two and, of and returns. I, and I don't think people understand how much the algorithm actually just feeds off itself, right. right? So if one tweet goes viral, he tweets another one that's doing well, way more people are seeing it. It's just going to continue. It really is a snowball. A little effect. bit of luck. like he, he like, yeah. And if, he, if the, he's so hot right now, if he throws out a card yeah. that hits like eight picks, it's going super viral. Right. He's going to get 50,000 followers. The next time he puts out like a sign up to underdog using my promo code, yeah. he's going to get a thousand signups just yeah. from like that one tweet. So there's this, there's this idea of 
of capturing the moment and doubling down on whatever works. But again, I, I do want to caution creators because like you still want to make sure that it's something that's sustainable for you in your mind mentally, because if you start to become known as something that you hate doing, you're going to resent fucking doing it over six months, over a year or something like that. And you're going to get burnt out and then have to yep. start all over again. Yep. Sports Illustrated uses <laughs> multiple AI generated writers. Yeah. I, I like saw headlines and I saw some people like talking about it. It's, it's like, not, not that it's a bad topic at all. And I'm glad we're talking about it, but it's like something I'm so uninterested in, in terms of it's just like irrelevant. Cause like, you're not a journalistic person. Yeah. And, and Sports that's, Illustrated, that's all it is. Yeah. Is if you study journalism at Syracuse, Northwestern, wherever you went, they, like the, the laws they teach you in journalism are very serious and I don't want to discount them. If you don't know those rules and the way of, of like authentic journalism, it's probably a non-story to you. Plus, AI generation is used in a lot of articles. It's how you get game recaps like created in two seconds instead of typing up how many yards this person had, how many interceptions they threw, right? AI can literally pull that information in seconds. So it's not the, – the disinterest for my part doesn't come from – the fact that like they are ruining journalistic integrity, yeah. it comes from like Sports Illustrated being fucking irrelevant in my mind. <laughs> like I, I don't know, I, I don't know. Maybe they are the top selling sports fucking magazine in the world, yeah. but that could have fooled me. Yeah. Like they were awesome when we were young, growing up. They were really, really cool because they were like the monopolized magazine. Yeah. But nowadays, you have a million Twitter followers or Twitter follows that give you the same news mm -hmm. in much quicker fashion, in better format, more native, like more interesting to you. To the point where like I'm like. This is a non-story because it's just, I don't know, like, who cares about Sports Illustrated? Yeah, they still <clears throat> hold a lot of brand equity, I think, yeah. for, for the general. And I know that they're also owned by um, some huge company that, that's super valuable. But, yeah, SI, they're trying. Like, I see them making moves in the market and things they're doing. But if you were to take a piece of their content, remove the SI watermark, and you took a piece of content from someone in this office. Would like, you be able to tell the difference? Yeah. Cause that piece would be better. And I think that's, that's what you're saying. It's like, I'm not going to give them the time of day if they're, you know, especially if they're now, you know, resorting to AI. All right. Let me, let me ask you again then with this. Uh, Cause I guess I don't really know the journalistic integrity, yeah. like rule book. If sports illustrated chooses to do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's weird to put like fake names and shit yeah. behind it, but does it really matter? Do people really care? Or is this another Example of virtue signaling. I think it's virtue signaling. Okay. But I don't know. What is, uh, what's. To, to me, the only issue is the putting a fake person behind. Like right. It, that's weird. And then a picture of a fake. Yeah, I have no problem with that. Very. I, weirdly enough, either. I have. I have I and it's pretty not realistic. Yeah. It's yeah. just like, that's bizarre. Right. Yeah, I got no bizarre. problem, just weirdo behavior. I just would rather than just say this is an AI generated article. Right. But, but that would get. Aren't no read it. No yeah. one. I mean, it, that actually so might work. Me, that's interesting. That actually is true. That might be better than some random. See, I'm ass. most interested in the fact that it was AI generated because now you get a true A/B test. Like, were people reading these articles? Were they better? And now you only care because it's Joe Smith who went to Syracuse and not uh, Josina Smithston who <laughs> came out of my Apple computer. <laughs> right, and it, it will again. It'll always just come back to like the quality of the work. It's like if yeah. if they're gonna have ten AI robots that write fucking fire quality articles. The consumer is going to read them. If they're uh, shitty, then it's like whatever. Yeah, and I also think if if SI was smart, I think this could have all been planned. Yeah, I wouldn't be shocked if this was their their move to gain some attention and then I was going to say this this feels it. like a desperate move from a company that's like really rapidly losing market share in of in an avenue that's like not very popular amongst the masses. Yeah, anymore. I I we've talked to SI a bunch. ABG is the big company that that owns them. I don't really know what the I don't know how they're still a company. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. But, like, they're still huge. Because, That's they, because they probably made so much money or have, like, just stupid investors. They also, ABG also has, like, the rights to Shaq. And it, it's very mm. complicated. I, I'm i sure we could get uh, the girls to break it down for us. You talked about AI in the last episode. I think it would be helpful to understand how to use that tool. What can you ask, ask it to do specifically? I think... That, I think we should just link back to and find the episode where we, we kind of broke down how you would use ChatGPT, the best ways to use. Yeah, I mean, AI. realistically, it, it's very cool on the surface. I don't know that I use it super often. I use it for, if I'm in like a creative rut, if I'm like, help me with alternative YouTube titles that are 
you know, they, it could take a lot of the admin work out of it and also spark some sort of creativity. I also think there's been like a level of AI closed captions. Yeah, like that sure. shit has been around for a long time, but we just now feel the need to, because it got so popular, we want to box it in and make everyone <laughs> aware that it's a certain thing. But like closed captions is definitely one. Like CapCut itself is such a powerful tool. Yeah. CapCut's like becoming a mod. Like it, it, it is available on TikTok, but it's also got its own yeah, it's mobile its own app, app and yeah. desktop app yeah. which i think is a f really really good hybrid of like premiere pro and iMovie where it does everything really really simply for you um but yeah i mean ai I'll, I'll be honest i don't use it that much in my workflow i do think product focused companies will start to use it to like expedite code to a crazy crazy level yeah. um and our cto jl has been using it often and um, I don't always understand what the fuck he's doing with it, but he's really excited about it, which yeah. excites me. So, yeah. like, I think that will help. But as of right now, the only thing I think with AI is the, I, the ability to, like, edit or make your content at a much higher volume, which will eventually, like, kind of saturate out a lot of people, I think, and higher quality. It's already happening. Yeah. Think about the quality of content. There used to be four channels, and then there were 40 channels, and then there were 100 channels. And then not only were there 100 channels, but then there was YouTube, and then there was Instagram, and then there's TikTok. That's why I don't, I don't feel bad when we don't get results on our content because our content's just not as good as someone else's yeah. on that day. And you can't be upset about that. People just have more options. They got better options. So uh, both of you have used food in some way to create content. What is it about food <laughs> that works with any pieces of content? I mean, food, everyone loves food. I think that, not everyone, but a lot of people love food. I think it's easy, especially in sports for us. That was an easy tie-in. It's part of the game. It's stadium food. It's tailgating. It's watching the games, stuff like that. Obviously, you did a big thing with food. Um, it's what, what did we do? <laughs> uh, it's funny that we're talking about this. We actually just made the decision to cut food from our long-form YouTube stuff, food reviews, different stuff like that. Interesting. Based off the data we're seeing a higher drop off on those parts of the video. So I was less excited about that because I actually want food and the game around the game to be included in our content. So we will introduce it back in at some point in time. But I also think it's about finding the right format, less so that people aren't interested in the food. Lengthy food reviews, I'm talking too long. People don't want to see me chewing. Yeah. Uh, some of the food isn't unique, right? Like if I try a cheeseburger that looks very average, like what, what is that bringing to the, to the viewer? So uh, it's, it's interesting, and it's this idea that we don't want to chase views or virality, but also sometimes you do have to listen to the audience by the data and be like, they don't want to see this right now. Yeah, I would say with us it was never like – we weren't like, let's make a food focused piece of content. It was just yeah. a piece of content we made. And I think the way that we set it up and made it was unique and very, I guess, different than whatever was out there and didn't really yeah. necessarily have to do with food. It was more like the gamification of, of, of lunch in a way. And, and the big takeaway is probably why food. Food is in every single person's Food's life. the common denominator, right. yeah. That's food. why everyone can relate to it. You everyone put a sports a piece of sports content in front of right. 10 people, seven of them will have no idea what the fuck you're talking yeah. about. But everyone understands food. Yes. And everyone can everyone can see. And food's also like something, you know, when you want to make a really impactful piece of content, you need to convey like emotions in some way, some sort of reaction. And food not only like is every everybody aware of what food is, yeah. but like you show a really like sexy piece of food people are <laughs> people like can smell it they could taste it yeah. in front of them right that, and, and they important. want it another part of that that i don't think you touched on was it also puts you in places visually and you relate to moments right yes. thanksgiving yeah. okay now i know where i am christmas i know where i am uh you're eating pizza okay i know like i think of italy or i think of my local pizzeria whatever it is and so moments are related to food it, it's 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 a it's a variation of storytelling right yeah. and if you can like somehow take that like the emotion or the energy from that and transfer it to your content and tell stories about it like if i'm talking about fantasy football it's like cool i could i could list the xyz's and the one two threes but i want to convey to my audience like man you got to grab this guy because like you don't want to be hanging out with your homies like on a sunday mm -hmm. you know watching the game your team's now losing your fantasy team's now losing by 10 because you didn't pick this guy up like yeah. you're you gotta you, you have to kind of master the art of storytelling and transfer the emotion that people are going to have with the action that you want to take. I have not read this article. 
that that you shared. Uh, younger generations have expressed interest in pursuing a career as a YouTuber. New programs are now teaching kids the skill sets that are increasingly popular. Uh, you said surely this can't be a good thing. What was the what was like the villain argument? Like um, we're just sending kids to camp to become YouTubers now. So hold on, okay. real quick. One, yeah, yeah. this would be a perfect example of using AI. You could put these bullet points or even this article into ChatGPT yeah. and say like, hey, give me a one paragraph, two paragraph summary of this so that when we read it, it's like there for you, right? Yeah. Like these are very, very like slight, simple things that help the admin work. Yes. Okay. So th the answer was people are sending kids to YouTube camp and you think that's a bad thing. What do you think? Uh, I think it's cool. Yeah. I don't think it's bad at all. I don't think, I, I don't think it's... So yeah, we are deep in the comments. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's fair. I, I think it could promote the wrong thing. Yeah. And it could promote the right thing. Like any schooling. Correct. And and I think like we've been saying from the beginning, most of the content, if you're creating content, if you want to be here for the long term, if you want to make this your real thing, it has to come from a, of an internal place. It has to come from a place of passion. It has to come from a place that you love. I'm a little bit worried that like the younger generation and why – a camp or whatever a school like this could become bad is because a lot of generations or a lot of the younger generation probably sees the fame from YouTube, the money from YouTube, the money, what all those like bad things that come along with it and being like, I want those things. I think if we normalize this idea that you can go to YouTube camp and X percent are doing it because they want to make videos and have yeah. fun with it. And X percent are like, I actually might be able to do this full time. And then there's like one kid there who's like, no, I could be Mr. Beast. The same way anyone who went to sports camp growing up was like, oh, I like playing basketball with my friends. This could be fun. Oh, maybe I could actually play on the varsity team or even go to college. And then there was that one kid who was like, well, I might be league bound, right? And even going league bound doesn't even mean you're going to be MJ or, or LeBron. So I think as long as, there, there will definitely be negatives to it. I think, yeah. And I think it's important that it's not like social, how to get influencer, social media famous. That would be. That I would wonder be. what they teach there. Did it, did it say in there? Do they, did they teach like the intricacies of like camera work and lighting? Or do they talk about getting views? Do they talk about working with like sponsors and stuff like that? That I think would be yeah. kind of weird. Like I think you'd have to progress to those other levels. I do think there's kind of a purity though, because it's not like when you're younger, your parents like force kids to go to these sports camps, yeah, these yeah. camps or whatever. I don't think any parents, I hope not, are like, I want you to go to YouTube camp to be a YouTuber. It's probably the kids being like, I really want to yeah, go. Yeah, but the kids probably want to be YouTubers for the wrong reason. Maybe. And that, I think that's the question. If a kid's like, I, like I have, I have a cousin who made videos, like just videos of film. He wanted to be a movie director, all this different stuff, like on the weekends or during the week with, and he would, he would, you know, staff his friends or kids in the neighborhood, his parents. That seems like it would have been a really good opportunity. The application process, I feel like, needs to be rigorous for yeah. this. Like, I need to know that you really want to be right? here. Because in any form of teaching, you. who's... I mean... <laughs> yeah, Bruh, exactly. Imagine. That'd be sick, actually. <laughs> I mean, that is kind of like our goal one day, is to sure. not necessarily put together a, a camp to corrupt young children. Um, but Pause. It is, it is to help teach people, like... I mean, this is YouTube camp. Yeah. Maybe if this podcast was called YouTube Camp instead of big content, that Sports Illustrated would write an AI generator. It's <laughs> a good segue. Appreciate you. That's all I got. We'll see you next week on Big Content.